Hey, it's Tucker Carlson. You may have found yourself wondering recently as the world slides closer to nuclear annihilation than any time in human history, why exactly are we at war with Russia? It seems like there's a pretty significant downside to this particular foreign policy decision, starting with economic collapse and ending potentially with extinction. So is there a good reason we're doing it? So many innocent young people have been killed. So many hundreds of billions of dollars have been wasted, some of them from the US Treasury. So what's the point? Are we really doing this so the Biden family can repay its debts to the oligarchs who finance their beach house in Rehoboth? Are we doing it so our government can continue to lie about its illicit bio labs in Eastern Europe? So that flabby losers like Toria Newland and Tony Blinken can feel like they're doing something important with their sad, empty lives? Really? Honestly, there's got to be a better reason for waging this the most pointless war of all. What is it? Well, thankfully, we have an answer. The war against Russia, ladies and gentlemen, the war against Putin and for Ukraine is in fact a war for democracy. Watch and recall the motive. The president has said many times we are focused on what we can do to support Ukraine's effort uh, to fight for their democracy. Democracy must prevail. The Ukrainian people are fighting the fight for their democracy and in doing so for ours as well. Assisting and helping Ukraine win this fight for democracy and freedom. And of course, Ukrainian President Zelensky understand that what's at stake in Ukraine is bigger than just his nation. It is literally a battle for freedom and democracy themselves. They are showing the world what an existential fight for democracy looks like. President Zelensky and the Ukrainians have changed the course of history for the better. And we unequivocally are with the Ukrainian people in their fight to remain a sovereign democracy. Unequivocally with the Ukrainian people to remain a democracy. It's a bipartisan view. Democracy must prevail. You just heard noted democracy expert Nancy Pelosi say, the daughter of the mobbed up mayor of Baltimore. As Pelosi puts it, the Ukrainian people are fighting the fight for their democracy and for ours as well. That's right, for ours as well. Without Ukrainian democracy, in other words, we can have no democracy here. If the Ukrainians aren't free, neither are we. We must make sure they can vote in Kiev so we can continue to vote in Kansas City. It's really that simple. And yet tonight, we regret to tell you that we have a problem. It looks like they're not going to be able to vote in Kiev anymore. And no, for once, it's not Putin's fault. Democracy in Ukraine seems to be suspended by the world's foremost democracy advocate himself, Field Marshal Zelensky. Watch this. Чи будуть в Україні наступного року вибори? Це ж питання глобальне. І якщо ми переможемо, то будуть. Значить, не буде військового часу, не буде війни. Вибори повинні проходити у час, у мирний час, коли немає війни, згідно законодавства. So when you have an election, well, he says if we win, we'll let people vote. Otherwise, no. You vote when we feel like it, because ultimately we're completely in charge and make all the rules. Your job is to obey or be punished. That's our version of self-government. Self means me. I'm the government. Now, that's not just any autocrat. That's our chief ally in the war for democracy. This is the guy who just announced he's likely to cancel next year's elections. So you've got to wonder what the Biden administration thinks of this. We can't possibly continue to support Zelensky, that guy, after he said that, can we? Because in a clip less than 30 seconds long, he just blew up our entire rationale for supporting his side in the war. So we can't support him. Oh, of course we can. And we will. Here's Joe Biden from yesterday reaffirming America's unequivocal support for Ukraine. No matter what happened in Russia, we, the United States, will continue to support Ukraine's defense and its sovereignty and its territorial integrity. So to recap, we are currently fighting a war for democracy on behalf of a leader who just casually announced he's happy to end democracy and our democracy supporting leaders have no problem with that. In fact, they're strongly for it. Shocked? You shouldn't be. Of course they're for it. You should have seen this coming. Wars for democracy always cancel democracy in the process. That's why our leaders love them. And they all do it, even the virtuous leaders. Abraham Lincoln suspended habeas corpus. The British government under Winston Churchill threw an entire opposition party into prison and let them rot for the duration, in some cases with their families. So in a war for democracy, you can do anything. <laughs> Imagine what a man might do who has fewer principles.
If that man, say, ran Ukraine, he might seize churches, arrest priests, ban all criticism of himself, disappear his political opponents. And that's happening. Just last month, Zelensky threw a man called Gonzalo Lira into prison indefinitely for the crime of daring to write about the Ukrainian government in unflattering ways. Now, what's interesting, what separates this from other such cases, is that Lira is an American citizen. So Joe Biden, who has quite a bit of SWAT, as they say in Ukraine, could have freed Gonzalo Lira within hours. But he didn't. He didn't want to. He didn't say a word about it. He remains in prison tonight. So that makes you wonder, what's the real motive here? When normal people see war, they see death and destruction, sadness and suffering. But that's not what demagogues see. They understand it differently. They know that war means power, mostly for them. During wartime, everything they do can be justified. War is the gravest of all emergencies. Imagine the COVID lockdowns times a thousand plus drones. Once war breaks out, politicians become gods with the power of life and death. So in a peaceful democracy, you have to debate your political opponents in public, and that's tiresome. But in a war for democracy, you can just throw them in jail or have them executed. You can see that many in Washington are looking forward to that moment. And that may be why they so fervently support Joe Biden, even many Republicans, against a potential opponent, the only opponent who opposes the war in Ukraine. If you were to end the war, their power would evaporate. Last week, a whistleblower produced WhatsApp messages from Hunter Biden, proving that at the very least, his father knew about his influence peddling businesses abroad and probably participated in them. Quote, I'm sitting here with my father, Hunter Biden wrote to his Chinese partners demanding money. As much as anything reported about the Bidens over the last several years, this was the smoking gun. There it is right there in the message. That would have been enough to cripple a normal president. It would have been more than enough to keep a normal president from running for office again. But it had virtually no effect on Joe Biden. Most media outlets ignored it completely or tried to spin Biden's relationship with his son as some kind of moral victory. Quote, the real meaning of the Hunter Biden saga, as I see it, wrote Nick Kristof of The New York Times, isn't about presidential corruption, but is about how widespread addiction is and about how a determined parent with unconditional love can sometimes reel a child back. <laughs> he actually wrote that. And if you doubt it, you should know that view was common. Here's the take from ABC. The Hunter Biden story, the scandal, the this, the that, it's also the story of a father's love. And Joe Biden has never and will never give up on his son, son Hunter, and will never treat him lesser than. And so he is a father first. Take it or leave it. So a whistleblower produces a text message showing that Joe Biden was in the room with his son when his son was selling influence to an enemy power, the Chinese government. And ABC's take on it, Joe Biden is a father first, take it or leave it. What accounts for a response like that? Well, that's the way you talk when you've got nothing to fear from an upcoming presidential election. You don't even bother to think of an excuse for your candidate because you don't need to. Your country has electronic voting machines. Joe Biden got 81,282,916 votes in 2020, and you're pretty sure he can do it again. In fact, you know he can. You're not worried. But actually, they should be a little worried. The people who control Joe Biden, Susan Rice, and the rest know they can continue to run our government, writing the press releases, formulating the policies, and they can do it effectively forever, as long as Joe Biden gets dressed in the morning. And of course, that's their strong preference. These are fervent opponents of change. But the one thing these people cannot control is aging. Joe Biden is old. He's 80 now. He'll be 85 at the end of the next term. People imagine that old age is a long, predictable progression from acuity to permanent unconsciousness. But often that's not at all how it actually works. When old people start to slide, they tend to slide fast. Joe Biden has begun that descent. Here he was yesterday. And here's what she wrote to me, and I quote, you can imagine my joy. She called them right away, and the next day they sent someone out to survey her yard. As Beth wrote, this is the best thing that's happened in rural America since the Rural Electrification Act brought electricity to farms in the 30s and 40s, end of quote. End of quote. You weren't supposed to hear that. Joe Biden read the stage directions out loud. That's like eating the garnish that comes with your entree. You're supposed to know not to do that. Joe Biden no longer does. 
In a year or two, he will be gone completely, and there will be no hiding it. At that point, the Democratic Party will face a secession problem. If Joe Biden is reelected next year and then forced to leave office during his term due to disability or death, that means Kamala Harris will become president of the United States. And nobody wants that, not even her husband. In real life, nobody likes Kamala Harris. That's not an attack on her. In fact, it's possible to feel pity for someone who's so universally reviled. It is instead an observation of unchanging physical reality like gravity or photosynthesis. Nobody wants Kamala Harris to be president. No one will benefit if she becomes president. So logic suggests there's going to be a change. It's going to have to be somebody else. And whoever that person is is going to have to enter the race soon, before the election, after Biden drops out. Who could that person be? We don't know, obviously. This is all just guessing. But we do know whoever that is will have to have two essential criteria. He'll have to be as shallow, ruthless, and transactional as Joe Biden is, and he'll need to have flattery skills that are so polished and advanced they'd be considered superior even in the Saudi royal court. And there's only one man in modern America who fits that description. Gavin Newsom, the governor of California, and perhaps not coincidentally, Joe Biden's new closest friend. I am here, Mr. President, Newsom told Biden at an event the two did together last week. I am here as a proud American, as a proud Californian, mesmerized by not just your faith and your devotion to this country and the world we're trying to build, but by your results, by your action, by your passion, by your capacity to deliver. <laughs> I am mesmerized by you, Joe Biden. <laughs> Imagine saying that as a compliment. You couldn't do it. Few human beings could do it. But Gavin Newsom had no problem at all. Those words rolled right off his forked tongue. He never stopped smiling. So if you're looking for the leader of the coup, there he is right there. Young here, people say the news is full of lies. Kennedy's motorcade. 239 people. The death of Jeffrey Epstein.